How are you? Good. What's going on? Thanks for bailing me out on short notice. No problem, man. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Cool. We're um so we're uh we're on campus, the bulk of us. This is our field trip day. That's and good. then um we got some kids who are at home and they're switching over from a different Zoom where we were just watching that uh social effects documentary from uh or social dilemma that's on Netflix. Yep. So they're they're coming over here. How's the family? We're hanging, man. Everybody's healthy and um, you know, we're just every day trying to trying to get through. Um you know, we're starting to see, you know, my wife works at MUSC and, you know, in the ER and they're starting to see a little bit of influx. So, you know, we're trying to keep a close tab on that. Uh, Jacob, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'm sorry. I lost you for a second uh, as I was switching from my earbuds so that the kids could hear you. Yeah. So, I know, yeah, I know your wife, back, if you could start there, then they can all hear you. Yeah, she, uh, so my wife is a, a, an emergency room social worker, and she deals, um, she deals with a lot of cases of abuse and neglect, and there's a lot of uh, comorbidity with COVID and abuse and neglect, and so, you know, she, uh, she, had her, she has her ears to the ground with COVID in Charleston, and, you know, we're starting to see, not unpredictably with what's going on in other parts of the country, you know, an uptick in, in, in the Charleston area, at least, of COVID positive cases. So we're just trying to keep an eye on that, but you know, we're, we're hanging in there. What, uh, now what about um, school and stuff and, and childcare? Yeah, you know, so, um, so Langston, our oldest son, who's six years old, he is at the College of Charleston's ECDC program. And they've been doing great. I mean, they have got those kids all wearing masks and, you know, doing a ton of uh, safe sanitary practices, hand washing. And, uh, and they, they kind of wanted to wait on the younger children just to see how they would be able to adapt them into the classroom um, and, uh, and on their little campus there. And uh, they just invited the youngest children. So my youngest son, who's two, um, is in their, you know, two-year-old class. And they just invited a small group of them to come a couple days a week, um, just to kind of have a little bit of an experience. So Simon is just uh, doing a couple days there too. So he's actually gone right now. So I am uh, enjoying something very strange, which is I'm at my house uh, for the first time in nine months by myself. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. My goodness. No, it's great, man. I'm happy to, happy to be able to help out. All right, everybody. Uh, uh, so uh, we had a group that came in from lunch and they're all settling down. They're getting all the notebooks out. And uh, so uh, I'll give you a teeny bit of background before I turn it over to you. And I'm going to ask, is it okay if I record this? Do it. Excellent. So um, I was explaining, you and I, we met this spring when we had um, pandemic programming and we created all this stuff during spring break. And we had a session, which was great. I think there was like, I don't know, eight or nine of us. And it was really good. And um, <clears throat> and then it's, uh, we watched your Channel 2 extended interview uh, from August. We watched that a little bit ago. Nice. And then uh, uh, I think one of the, your classmates or your friends, students came to that New Zealand uh, public health professor uh, session we had, which was really, it was nice because uh, it made a lot of the kids feel good. Uh, you know, uh, learning about COVID, it almost sounds counterintuitive, like you're trying to depress everybody, but really if you intellectually and emotionally understand this, it will help you sort of uh, navigate it a little bit, a little bit differently. And then we, uh, I think I put this in the email to you, uh, Lathams is this really neat quarterly journal. Yeah. And we got everyone the epidemic issue. And so we've been reading that. And so we feel like we're way more primed to do right by your sharing your time with us than we were back in, in March and April. And we were talking about how um, cause I, I, I was going to be a historian, mm -hmm. but finding a job, it just didn't, in Charleston seemed impossible. And you've, a positive part of COVID is, you know, incredibly desirable as a, as a, prof a professor of epidemics and disease. Yeah. And, uh, we were wondering if that's, uh, already beginning to shake out for you. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome question. Thank you. Thank you for all that. And, uh, it sounds really incredible what y'all are doing. So 
Um, this is, you know, if there's one thing that I, that I, that I want to be a take home message today to y'all. And, you know, I've been saying this increasingly in all the public kind of stuff I'm doing is that the only way to defeat COVID is through education, actually. Um, yes, it's going to take a biomedical approach, probably through a vaccine, but it's going to take education. Um, so the kind of work that y'all are doing right now is it's the real work, um, you know, to deal with natural disasters of which a pandemic is. Um, yeah, so it's been different. You know, most, uh, most people that are trained as academic historians like myself, you know, we tend to um, working, work on a PhD project for about 10 years and you get really specialized in your knowledge. And one of the things that this pandemic has helped to teach me is, is to speak to the public more about, about my research and, and the value of thinking through history in a, in a deeper way. Um, not just through, you know, what you might see in a documentary or, you know, on the History Channel or on a podcast, but, you know, using my platform and my research as a kind of public tool to help, you know, engage. So it's actually been really fun. It's, you know, it's a very odd and maybe even a little perverse thing to say, but, you know, talking about COVID and, you know, you describe it as a kind of, you know, cathartic educational kind of, you know, experience. And I think that, you know, that's what I found too, is, you know, the more people I talk to, the more interviews that I do, um, you know, the more optimistic I become about humanity and our human approach to trying to solve this natural disaster. Oh, that's great. Uh, so um, wherever you want to take this, we're here, we're listening. If it, it works out that there's questions, the kids might have some. Um, just thank you for your time. And uh, thank you. Can I ask for questions? Can I get some participation to start out with? Oh, sure. So um, thanks, y'all, again. And, and I got some things I want to talk about. And it sounds like from what, what you all have been uh, learning about, especially in the last couple months, I think you're really poised to do this. So I'm wondering what, what you all think is the reason that we haven't solved COVID-19 yet. Why are we over this pandemic? You know, I hear a lot of people, my friends, my family, People, you know, people in the news, people, you know, in general, they say things like, I'm over COVID-19. I'm done with this pandemic. I want to be done with it. But the reality is that we're not done with it. And, you know, the reality is in the last week, cases across the country have risen. Cases across the world are rising. We're actually experiencing right now, right now today, the worst day of experiencing COVID-19 that has ever happened since the beginning of the pandemic worldwide. Today's the worst day. Tomorrow might be worse. Tomorrow might be better. But right now is the, uh, you know, the height of the pandemic. So why isn't this over yet? What do you, what do you all think? I've got someone in person right here, uh, Jacob. This is uh, Waverly, one of our sixth graders. Hey, Waverly. I think that the reason might be because the way the government and the people are handling this, a lot of people aren't used to things like this and they don't understand this as well as the, because the government isn't actually helping people understand this, helping people get to know why this is happening and how they can stop it more because people themselves aren't listening and they don't. Um, and I think if they did listen and if the government tried to speak more, then we would have uh, a much more effective coronavirus um, ridden uh, place in the world. That's a great Waverly. Thank you so much for that, that, that insight. That is, um, that is so incredible what you just identified there as thinking about one of the reasons that we haven't um, effectively dealt with, with this crisis, with this pandemic. And, 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 you know, just to summarize what you said, Waverly, was that, you know, at some level, we have had a crisis of leadership, of global leadership, of national leadership, of local leadership. And also what you identified, Waverly, is individual responsibility, or another way to put that is individual responsibility. And, and that's a, a valence, right, a relationship between people that are lawmakers and positions of power that, that govern our communities, govern our nations, and then everyday people like you and I who go about our, in, our individual lives and make individual choices. And stopping something like a pandemic requires both. It requires leadership at all levels of government, 
and it requires individual responsibility from the ground up. And I think the fact that you've just identified one of the most complicated problems of dealing with COVID-19 is actually extremely positive for going forward and dealing with this. Other hands raised, any other ideas why we haven't solved this crisis yet? And so uh, students at home, uh, if you could put up your hand, I'm gonna turn it over to Leo, one of our in-person juniors right here, uh, Dr. Stier Williams. Hey, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I guess my thoughts on it is just building on what you said, it's just the individualism of it and people that aren't personally affected or haven't had friends or family actually catch the coronavirus feel like they're immune to it or it can affect them. And I think, I mean, nothing has changed with people's psychology. There's not a surefire cure or, um, you know, an effective or widespread vaccine yet. And so really there's just been no concrete changes. It's just been the span of time and people are just, I guess they're just fed up and they feel like they should be back to normal by now. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Thank you so much for that comment. And, you know, I think you're right is, and there's actually a lot of research that's, um, that's in psychology and, and it's about the psych the psychology that we all have of thinking about our own individual places in the world. Right. And, and, and some of that research of, that as it relates to pandemics suggests that until you as an individual, until you have someone in your immediate family and friend circle that either gets sick in a serious way or dies, that the vast majority of people have a hard time taking a, a disease like this seriously until that happens. So if you haven't been personally affected the research suggests that your individual choices are not gonna be as altruistic. So thinking about others, right, instead of just yourself. And, and that's an important insight here too, as to, you know, if we go back to what Waverly said of talking about individual responsibility, right? There's a kind of government responsibility, but an individual responsibility. And that individual responsibility is often hard for people because dealing with a pandemic like this, a respiratory infection, it requires, people to be doing exactly what y'all are doing that are in, the, in, in that classroom right now. You are appropriately distanced and, and you're masked up, right? That's an individual choice that you're all making, but it's also a choice that your teachers and school officials are making at the same time. So that requires participation together to be able to make that happen. And if you think about how how is it functioning in your school right now? I'm guessing that any one of you could tell me like, this is our reality. Like we do this because we all know that it's safe and it's the right thing to do right now, right? Yes, sir. And, but what happens when you step out of your school? Do you see, do you see the, the microcosm of your school and the safety that's happening there? Do you see that when you step out into the Charleston community? Um, I think it's definitely not as strong as it is in the school because in the school we're seeing each other, you know, every day we build close interpersonal connections. But I mean, people, if you're seeing them, you know, out on your street or whatever, you don't know that person. You might just see that person once in your whole life and never learn their name. Yeah, that's right. You know, I think like if we take small environments as, as case studies or litmus tests of you know, of how our societies in general are dealing with this pandemic, what we see is at some hyper local levels, just like your school and like many schools like yours, like the one my son goes to too, they're able, if that relationship is forged between individual responsibility, people taking it seriously, because you care about the people that are sitting next to you and you care about your teachers and you care about their families, that when that happens, people can make real positive change in, in stopping an epidemic like this. But as you go more remote into the Charleston community, and just like you said, you don't know every person on the street, and you don't know as you even widen that circle, people that are living in other cities, people that are living in other countries, it becomes harder for a lot of people to rationalize how their individual decisions are impacting people all around the world, right? And, and, and that's something that, you know, a lot of people just, 
just are, are really struggling, you know, almost a year into this pandemic to be able to think like that, to be able to think altruistically that their individual decisions really do matter right now. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for speaking with us. Thanks. Um, anybody else have any uh, any reasons? I mean, the other one that, that, of course, we haven't talked about is is something that was in the news this week that, that you guys might have talked about, which is the news coming out of Pfizer, working with this, you know, German company, that there's a vaccine that they're testing, which is getting closer, that seems to be about 90, 92% effective. Um, you know, that's one of the other reasons that we haven't curbed the, the COVID-19 pandemic is because we don't have either a, a therapy, right, a drug that you can take that will cure you of the disease, or a vaccine, which is on the front end, which will protect you from the disease. Why, why haven't, you know, we have, you know, this is another question maybe I'll throw out to y'all. Why, why haven't we, why don't we have either one of those? Why don't we have either a vaccine or a, a drug, a treatment that we can take? You know, we are living right now in 2020 during the period, you know, I'm a historian of medicine and medical science. And I can tell you right now, there is no other time in, in world history that I'd rather be living than right now because we have the most up-to-date science that we have ever had in human history. And yet we haven't cracked this code. So what, what, what have been the hurdles? All right, we've got a Meredith, this is one of our sixth grade girls uh, right here. Hi, thank you for hey. being um, It's taking us so long, even though we have such a uh, advanced medical history, it's taking us so long because um, just like testing, um, vaccines and stuff like we still don't know fully about COVID and we still don't know all the information and just overall vaccines take a while to make so yes thank you there is a um there's a long history of of people like myself of historians of medicine who have looked at the development of vaccines over the last say 100 150 years and at no point in human history have have scientists been able to create a vaccine that's highly effective in a short amount of time five years 10 years often 15 years it takes to produce and test uh and roll out and make available vaccines for for the human population so you're absolutely right and you know and that's another thing that i think is part of you know if if, if what we were talking about before and some of the questions were about our own human behaviors and our own sense of altruism and why do we all wear masks and why do we try to stay safe? Well, it's to protect people in our communities and to protect people around the world that we might not even know. Well, I think there's also upon this point that you're talking about a very interesting way in which, and you, I think all of you probably know and have had these conversations of people saying, you know, for the last almost year now, we just need to wait until there's a vaccine and that will overnight stop the coronavirus. And as a historian, that's been interesting for me to think about because I think we do wanna hold out for the promise of a vaccine and a vaccine will be a long-term solution for COVID. But all of the infectious disease specialists that I know that are friends of mine that work on in this area, all of the people that that work on vaccines, what they say is, even if we had a, a, a vaccine, which seems quite, a, seems quite effective for, for COVID-19 by Christmas, it still might take one or two years to be able to distribute it at an effective level throughout our communities in the US. And that's just in the US, let alone thinking about the world. Because one of the things that, that is so strikingly different about pandemics is that they are global worldwide phenomenon. You know, what happens in rural China impacts what happens in North Africa, which happens impacts what happens in Paris, which impacts what happens in LA and Charleston. We are all from a kind of biological perspective, we are all connected in, in really deep ways, right? And not just interpersonal, but we're, we're connected biologically. And I think that's the, that's the thing that a lot of people, I think, need to keep in mind about a vaccine solution 
is yes, we need to be investing in vaccines. We need to be believing in vaccines and hopeful that they will make a difference, but it's not gonna be overnight. Thank you. Excellent. I am going to, if you don't mind, um, I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a few things um, prepared. And I'll, talk, I'll maybe talk for a little bit and then, uh, and then we'll go back to some questions maybe. How does that sound? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, well, th thanks all for getting, getting this discussion going. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit today um, with you about this concept. And it's really one that, that already we've been talking about in this, in this little bit of a dialogue that we had about individual responsibility and about the promise of a vaccine. And that is this question of uncertainty or what we might think about as being called epidemic uncertainty. When do epidemics end and how do epidemics end? This is a question that I've been asked a lot. I've been asked a lot by newspapers and I've been doing some interviews for podcasts and other things. I've been giving a lot of public talks and over and over again, people wanna know, you're a historian of epidemics. You've studied a bunch of epidemics in past human history. How do these things tend to end? And, and it's a really, really fascinating question. Um, one is, and I'll go back to those slides, but if I just pulled up a very simple Google question of when will COVID-19 end? And the first four hits all say from major outlets, say something completely differently. That to me is mind blowing. And, and what it suggests is that we just don't know. We have the economist on one hand saying COVID-19 will be done by the end of 2021, so in about a year, and the Atlantic saying that COVID-19 will never go away. And, and, and those are two very different realities for us. I don't think that very many people are sitting here in, 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 in November of 2020 and thinking that this is the way that school is always going to be, or that, you know, uh, that our lives are always going to be exactly like they are right now. One of the things I can tell you as a historian who studied uh, epidemics and pandemics in the past is our lives will not always be like this. We will not be wearing masks to school every day for all of the time that we are in school. I don't believe that we will. We are still, and here's where having that historical perspective, I think is, it can bring some positivity to you. Like, like you said, Jason, it, it often, you know, in the, in the first blush seems negative, but it actually can provide some hope and some promise. And, and what, you know, COVID in, in some historical perspective, I think we can say is that we are still in the middle of this pandemic. We are still dealing with something that is a crisis of a natural disaster. We will get to the other side of COVID-19. I, I am very confident of that. And I think that I wanna share with you two kinds of um, ways that COVID-19 might end and how each of those solutions we can maybe think through using history and the history of pandemics to try to prepare ourselves for either one of those kind of crossroads, right? Where I think you know, or paths rather, that we're at a crossroads right now. And then later I wanna share with you my book, which I just got copies of here and I'm just gonna gloat because I have no one to gloat with here in person. So I'm just gonna do that maybe later on with y'all. So there are two solutions to COVID-19 that I think will happen. And, and I think it's gonna be one or the other. One is a vaccine solution. And it's one that, that we just brought up. And the history of vaccine development and vaccine research, um, it, it has a very interesting history, a very long history of from the 18th century of dealing with smallpox, which is one of the most deadliest diseases in human history. Fortunately, smallpox has been eradicated globally from the mid 1980s. In fact, uh, I was just telling this to somebody recently, it's a good trivia question. Uh, smallpox has been the only 
infectious human disease that's been eradicated around the world. And it's also the smallpox virus is the most heavily guarded thing in America right now. So at the CDC in Atlanta, just a few hours away from where all we're sitting, we have samples, the, the, the US government has samples of smallpox virus that we keep to study, right? And study how smallpox uh, in its history has impacted the world. But smallpox is not a disease that is just out in the quote unquote wild human populations that people get sick with anymore. So there's a history of how that came to be. How did smallpox come to be eradicated? And that was through a solution that was first through a, a, an inoculation and then through a vaccination and, and a global vaccination program. But then again, that global vaccination program took decades to stomp out that disease and to be able to prevent that disease. There's a whole bunch of other stories too. And they're ones that, that any, any, uh, any person in, in your school will know about. And that's the more recent development from about the 1930s in America and in Western Europe of more modern vaccines. And so you think about the whole gamut of vaccines that you have to take, um, you know, when you're growing up and you have the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, you have a whole host of vaccines that you take and have to get um, up on your, your immunological response on every few years while you're young. And the development of those vaccines roughly took between 40 and 50 years to get right, as quote unquote, to be able to produce effective vaccines, to roll them out of the population and to be able to have effective prevention. So that uh, by and large, most uh, adults that, uh, that reach, people that reach uh, the age of being an adult, um, 18 to 35, in, in 2020, have very, very small chances of getting a whole host of infectious diseases like measles, like mumps, uh, barring the outbreak in the College of Charleston last year, um, like diphtheria and whooping cough and a whole range of diseases that probably most young people don't even know about today, but for which they have effectively been vaccinated against. And they have immunological protection because of those vaccines. And even that history of the development of those vaccines for deadly infectious diseases, some of those diseases like diphtheria and, and scarlet fever were much more virulent than COVID-19 is today. And by virulent, I mean deadly in the population. So the vaccine solution, and I'll talk more a little bit about that in a minute, it's one that if you look through even recent human history, what we find is the development of a vaccine, its rollout in a population, and its streamlining. And by that, I mean the sort of everyday public health reality of making it law that before you can go to a school, you need to be up to date with your immunological record, with your, with your shots, with your vaccines that doctors are regularly prescribing it, that there's a protocol, that there's a standardization of how much of a vaccine to give, when do those doses need to be re-upped. Those are all standardized in, in 2020 for a whole host of diseases. They're not for COVID-19 right now. We're still at a very early stage of not just finding a vaccine that works. That's the sort of problem of right now of being in the middle of a pandemic. But the longer term strategy, if our solution is going to be through a vaccine, is being able to roll it out, to standardize it, and to make it something that's just an everyday reality. That's going to, history tells us, take a very long time. In the meantime, so that's kind of one path that we might take, is finding a vaccine and trying to roll it out and then make it standardized. And there's some good historical examples we can point to here. Uh, the other solution, whoa, my mouse went crazy. The other solution here is, is, is a solution that, that models or, or, or it maybe is like this article that has the headline in the Atlantic, the coronavirus is never going away. And that's one too that I think most people aren't thinking through. Most people that I talk to and most you know, most things I read 
are focused on the vaccine solution. But there's another solution that I actually think is much more likely, and that is the reality that COVID-19 actually doesn't go away, or at least doesn't go away in ways that we think it might go away. And that's, a you know, to answer and to think through that approach, we need to look to evolutionary biology. And there's some really good models in evolutionary biology that can help us to understand COVID-19. And we know a lot about other infectious diseases, bacterial borne diseases and viral borne diseases like COVID-19. And, and I've got a bunch of colleagues that work in this area of evolutionary biology. And what they do is they sequence the genomes of different infectious diseases or rather the causative organism for those infectious diseases. And what we found for other diseases and what we might use to think about COVID is that for long periods of human history, dealing with epidemics is nothing new. And in fact, if you take a long historical approach to thinking about human history, diseases and epidemics have been a reality and an everyday reality of just being human. And from what we know using approaches from evolutionary biology is that when diseases are new, when they mutate and human populations don't have have an effective immune, immunological protection against them, don't have the antibodies for your body to be able to fight those new infections. So just like COVID-19 and we're dealing with right now, is that when those mutations tend to happen, the virulence of a disease is very high. Again, virulence is that biological measure that indicates how lethal a disease is in amongst a population. So when a disease is new, when a mutation happens, that virulence is really high. And that over time, the symbiotic relationship between our bodies and how we can fight a disease and how that disease is trying to find more human hosts to be able to attack and replicate is what happens is over time that the virulence of a disease goes down, it lowers. And so, if we take some other historical examples of other infectious diseases, what might happen to COVID-19 if we can't either find a preventive vaccine and roll it out amongst the whole world, and in order to be effective, it's going to have to be the whole world, or find a treatment, a drug to be able to, so you get sick with COVID, you can just go in and take a drug and then heal yourself. If that's not going to happen, then history tells us that COVID-19 will continue to stay within the human population. It's a respiratory disease, as you all know, so it spreads very easily. We are social beings. You know, there's, a, there's an amazing amount of research about how social humans are, right? Particularly compared to other living things in the environment. There are some great examples of other social insects like bees, for example, but humans are probably the most social of all living creatures. And respiratory diseases just spread very easily amongst social creatures like humans are. And so without a preventive vaccine and without an effective drug or therapy, we will have to continue to live with this disease. However, what all of the modeling suggests and what all of the historical data suggests is that over time, COVID will get better. And by better, what I mean is it will kill fewer people. It will make people by and large less violently ill. It will, you know, we'll see fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths over time. And, and that's a kind of solution that I haven't seen very many people either talking about or preparing for. Now that doesn't mean from a kind of public health perspective that we should all just take off our masks and go and go party because we'll all just get sick and then COVID will, will decrease. That's not really what this approach is, is saying. What this approach does suggest though from looking at other diseases is that if we can, you know, you guys would probably remember this phrase flatten the curve, right? If we can all just 
participate and do our own part of wearing masks and trying to distance of trying to be safe in our own individual lives and in our communities that over time we be, will be able to lower that curve of COVID morbidity of sickness and mortality and death. And, and this is where that research, that perspective is coming from, is coming from this historical and biological evidence from other diseases, which suggests that if we just hold out for another year, another six months, nobody knows how long that's going to take, then COVID-19, because of a whole bunch of really complicated factors that have to do with the, the, the biology of the, the, the virus, and the biology of our immune system, and the environment, and how those things all come together, that we will see COVID-19 transition from what it is now, a pandemic, to an epidemic, to where we'll just see it in isolated pockets, maybe in different countries, and then finally to an endemic disease. And an endemic disease is something that you all know, something like the common cold or the common flu. So something that is seasonal, something that you might get, something that you might even make you sick for a few days or maybe a week. And then the vast, vast majority of people recover from and go about their lives. That is probably the most viable reality that we can expect um, in the future for COVID. 19. And I want to turn to a few um, historical examples to help us to think through um, either one of these solutions of, of ending COVID-19. And one is the vaccine solution. And I just want to share, you know, I talked a little bit about earlier about the eradication of smallpox started in the 18th century and didn't, didn't be completed until the 1980s. It took well over a hundred years for people around the world to be able to effectively create a vaccine and distribute it throughout the world. I mean, just think about that for a minute. If it took a hundred years for us to solve COVID-19, to be able to completely eradicate it. But there are other models here in, in historical examples that I think are much more effective. Um, one is the example that, that, that I think older people will know about, and I find that a lot of young people don't know about, and that is the the vaccine for, for polio. Um, I remember I grew up in Michigan and I remember um, I had a bunch of family in Chicago and you know a couple times a year we would we would all jump in you know my family would jump in the in the truck and we would drive down to Chicago to see our family and my great aunt my mom's aunt her name was Aunt Kate she was a she was a little old Polish lady who made amazing food she, um, she had polio and she was, uh, she was disabled um, from the waist down. And, uh, and she was part of that generation that dealt in the 1940s and the 1950s with the biggest increase in polio um, in, in American history. And it was in that period, the 1940s and the early 1950s, when scientists, right after the, you know, the development in the 1930s of uh, microscopes that could see viruses and not just bacteria, um, so there were some technological changes, that scientists first started to look at developing vaccines for viral-borne diseases, of which polio and of which COVID-19 are examples. They're viruses. Viruses are way magnitude smaller than, than bacteria. And there were two guys, two American scientists, their names were Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, who were both working on a polio vaccine. Polio is this disease who seemed to be cases on the rise in the 1940s, the early 1950s. Um, some people will also know that, uh, that, that FDR was a, was a polio victim. He was a young man. Um, and there was this sort of moment in American history when everyone was looking at this dangerous epidemic of polio and looking for a way to stop it. And it galvanized support. Um, the biggest um, foundation fundraising campaign in American history began with polio. It's called the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. It was started by FDR um, in his second presidential term. And it raised millions of dollars 
from the everyday American people. It was called the March of Dimes, and some students might still know that, that name, the March of Dimes. That was created in the 1940s to raise money, to get every American, if they could just chip in a dime, then we could raise the money needed to fight polio. Something later happened in the 1960s to fight cancer. That was the model and one that I think we still very much um, rely on today. Think about breast cancer awareness for as an example that you know everybody here will, will, will be aware of. Um, in the 1940s, all of this money is being, was being poured in to fight and do research on polio. And these two guys, Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin, kind of duped it out to try to develop a, a polio vaccine. And Jonas Salk eventually did develop a successful vaccine for polio, and he's heralded as a kind of American hero, uh, as a scientist. And what's interesting about this uh, development of this vaccine, as polio rates are, are, are rising in the US, as this is seen as kind of the, 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 the epidemic of the time, you know, and we can think about how, how all, you know, everybody's so focused on COVID-19 right, COVID right now. That was sort of similar to the 1940s and early 1950s with polio. And so here is this vaccine that gets rolled out and developed, but the way that it happened is actually should give us a little bit of pause. So when Salk had an early vaccine that seemed to be effective, he went to something called the Watson Home. And it was a home uh, for uh, disabled children. And he went there and he experimented that vaccine, which had never been tested on those children against their will. And it was, by all accounts today, an extremely unethical, you know, we would never do anything like that uh, today, knock on wood. But it was a time where there was a crisis and Salk had a small sample size of a vaccine that he believed worked. And luckily, very, very luckily, that small experimental trial that he did at the Watson home it was successful and it did show a lot of promise. Um, so I want to be clear that while maybe we should question the ethics of it, it was successful. Um, and then he rolled out probably the most famous trial in Pittsburgh to school children all around the Pittsburgh area in 1954. And it was heralded as the first real modern successful vaccine in American history. And in a short period of time, within, a, within 10 years, from 1951, from that first experiment until 1960, polio was almost prevented in, in all across America. And it's probably the example, you know, that I've been trying to think about for how successful we can go from developing a new vaccine to completely rolling it out amongst the population. And the polio vaccine is probably, probably the best um, example. We have a, a, a history of a whole bunch of other uh, vaccines that were created for other diseases um, as well. It's just a little uh, uh, visual that helps you understand some of the other diseases for which we were developing vac vaccines. I mentioned earlier uh, the 1950s, this, this little bubble here in the middle for polio, measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox uh, to be developed more recently in, in history. But there's another solution that I want to, you know, mention that I mentioned earlier that I want to touch on too, and that is without a vaccine or without therapy, what might happen if we just have to deal with COVID-19 as an endemic disease, as a disease that we can't cure and we can't prevent, and disease that just lives in our population. And, and, and the best example that I can think about is actually a disease that I just finished writing a book on, typhoid fever. So... Typhoid is a disease long that's long been with uh, humans. Uh, it's a food and waterborne disease. It's a bacterial disease. So in many respects, it's very different than COVID-19. It's not a respiratory disease. It's spread through contaminated food and water. And yet typhoid was a disease in the 19th and in the early 20th century that was one of the biggest killers. It would be explode in Western Europe and North America into these giant epidemics from year to year in different areas. And it was a disease that was extremely complicated. There was no treatment for typhoid and there was no preventive vaccine for typhoid. And yet 
by the early 20th century, by World War I, Western Europe and North America had almost eliminated typhoid from the map. And one of the questions and one of the reasons that I wrote this book was to ask the question of how, how did we do that? How did we stop a disease for which we had no cure and no prevention? And in my book, I, I go through how that, how that worked. How did the scientific knowledge develop to be able to see that typhoid was spread through contaminated water, through contaminated food, through healthy carriers, people just like today with COVID who show no symptoms but can still transmit the disease to others. And I look at how that scientific disease developed, and then I look at how, how it was that the disease was, was reduced, how it was that it was essentially a non-factor after World War I. And here's what I found in, in researching and studying for that book. Typhoid, solving the typhoid problem, it took everything in, this is why I asked these questions at the beginning of our talk today, and I want to go back to that as maybe one of my, a couple of my final points here. Solving typhoid, like we have done in the past, is actually a kind of model for how we might solve COVID-19 in our own time going forward. Solving typhoid fever required people to make individual choices, to make good choices about their sanitary habits of what kind of water did they drink? What kind of food did they eat? Their hand washing and their sanitary practices. If you got sick, quarantining at home and isolating, right? But it also, so it took individual responsibility and individual behavior, not unlike what we are all dealing with right now of being asked to wear masks, to socially distance, and to not do big gatherings. It took that to solve the typhoid problem too. But it also took government and legal means. It took laws to be able to say that companies couldn't adulterate food, that companies couldn't adulterate and contaminate water supplies. It took top-down government safe public health measures to be able to stop the typhoid problem. And I think that that's what we're gonna need to solve the problem of COVID-19 as well. We're gonna need new laws to respond to uh, the kind of problems that we're facing for the spread of this disease. We're going to need in much the same way that solving typhoid took uh, changing our, our domestic sanitation and our city sanitation you know, being able to have water treatment facilities, being able to have uh, functioning toilets and, and sinks in our houses that wouldn't spread bacteria. Well, maybe for COVID-19, we're gonna need new air filtration systems. We're gonna need infrastructure level scientific solutions. And all of these things for, to stop typhoid had to come together. They had to come together of individual people taking responsibility, governments, taking responsibility and creating new laws and thinking about new novel scientific solutions. And I think that's exactly, if we don't have a drug for COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19, that's what we're gonna need. We're gonna need everyday people to buy in, we're gonna need new laws, and we're gonna need new scientific and engineering kinds of solutions. So those are the things that, that I think, you know, as to maybe summarize here, um, and you know, to think about what it is that and how we might be dealing with, with new pestilences like this, of invading armies coming into our communities of diseases. And you know, if we can focus on those solutions, our own individual solutions, and contributing to broader public health and governmental and scientific solutions, then I do think not only if we're living with COVID-19 that it will go down, but that we will successful be, successfully be able to combat it. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble on for a half hour. Y'all have any questions? <coughs> Oh my God, that was exactly what we needed. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was perfect. <clears throat> uh, we, we had been speculating about um, uh, the architecture of future designs of school buildings and stuff. 
you know, that they would probably have to be open-ended. Like we're in a gym that's been repurposed into a central location before students go out and have classes outside or in rooms that have, we have 22 of these hospital grade purifiers, nice. you know, wow. rooms that have windows. It's just been a lot. And we know that this is going to be a couple of years, but hearing from you is important because we all hear our own things from family members or wherever people get news. Uh, you know, talking to you about these two different outcomes, it should settle you a little bit to know it's not, I don't know, that, that research has been done and it gives us a lot of clues and insights into where it might go. And that should settle you emotionally uh, while we satisfy our curiosity intellectually. And so for you to come share uh, insights on short notice, hats off to you. We are very grateful. That's great. This is really fun. And, you know, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, I like to always tell young people too is, you know, as a historian, you know, and especially as a historian of science and medicine, real solutions, and, and this is going to sound so cliche and cheesy, but I, I'm 100% promise you that I'm right, that real solutions to solving human problems, problems like this, they're not going to come from older people like me or your teachers. They're going to come from you. They're going to take young people finding new ideas, thinking outside of the box, trying to find solutions, and coming together to solve real problems. And, and that's, that's where real, you know, it's always time after time after time again, if you look at history and how we have moved forward on an issue, whether scientifically or socially, right? it's almost always been when young people come together and find novel solutions. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna lift up my computer and we're all gonna say goodbye and thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for sharing your special. I know you don't have a lot of time by yourself. <laughs> and please thank your wife and kids for sharing uh, you with us today. And the kids online, they'll all uh, turn their video on and they'll all say thanks as well too. So Dr. Steer Williams, thank you again. We're very grateful. <laughs> There you go. There you go. See y'all. Take care. Hang in there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. And we and we will see you soon. Sounds good. All see right, Jacob. Take, take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're done for now. Uh, we're taking a break. For, I think it's like 15 minute break or something, isn't it? And then we're gonna, we're gonna finish through. So please get up, eat, stretch, go to the bathroom and we'll figure out what's gonna go on here. We're gonna see on the regular Zoom link in 15 minutes.